You're listening to the Play Therapy Podcast with Dr. Brenna Hicks, your source for centered and focused play therapy coaching. Hi, I'm Dr. Brenna Hicks, the Kid Counselor. This is the Play Therapy Podcast where you get a masterclass in child-centered play therapy and practical support and application for your work with children and their families. In today's episode, I'm going to do a mini lightning round. So I'm going to be answering five questions from three listeners. But before I get into the questions, I want to share an email that I received from Tammy in Ireland. And she was sharing a little bit about her journey and finding CCPT and working with a child. And it was kind of a little case study vignette, if you will, that she shared in the email. And I was given permission to read parts of it. So I want you all to hear what her experience was, because I think that it resonates with all of us when we think back to one of the earliest times that we were just in awe of the process working, even when we weren't really sure how or why it was working. (laughs) So Tammy, thank you so much for emailing and thanks for giving me permission to share this. So she said, there's no need to respond at all, which of course I did. But anyway, I'm just now starting my journey in play therapy and I only have about 50 hours under my belt. So then she goes on to say that she found the podcast. She's purchased some CCPT books, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So then this is the case vignette. My first client, who I've had for 15 hours, has had medical trauma, presented as angry at everyone, highly anxious, and ended up on my door. I was most uncertain of what to say, so I said very little. I had to set no limits with her, and we played doctor and patient for 13 sessions. In the last two, she wanted to chat. I wished that she had continued playing. I got through it and we are done. I don't have any choice. My trainee time per child is up. So just for context, she is limited to how many sessions she has with each child. So at the 15 session mark, she had to stop. But then she goes on to say, however, the point of this little story is in my ignorance. I watched amazed as this young girl played through her process and used me to help her as I was the doctor and patient too. whatever she wanted. She is 10 years old and parents have never seen her play with a doctor's kit. She's doing well, and there are changes to be seen across different environments, and I am watching in awe. Yes, CCPT is definitely for me, and I'm so excited for when the time comes when I do know what I'm doing. So, Tammy, first of all, you obviously know what you're doing enough because you watched her process what she needed to process with you. And again, above all, it's relationship. So our skills are never as impactful as the relationship that we build. And it's very clear, evident from your email that this little girl was able to build the relationship she needed to do the healing work that she needed to do. So Tammy, thank you for writing in. Thank you for letting me share that. And I hope that that jogs all of our memories of those early days in play sessions where we just sat back in wonderment of, oh my word, I don't even know what I did or what I didn't do or how this works or why this works or what's even happening. But look at all of the amazing things that are taking place right in front of our very eyes. So So exciting to get to have those moments in the play sessions. And I really wanted to share that with you all. So I appreciate you sending that into me, Tammy. All right, so let's get into questions. I'm going to be answering one question from Gabby, three from Texie, and one from Stephanie. So we'll start with Gabby in South Africa. This is actually the individual that I read her email a while back as she is an art teacher. And she talked about how she has started using child-centered principles in her art classes. So she wrote in and said, I'm wondering how important it is to have parental support and buy-in. Oh boy, that's the question, right? (laughs) Obviously, it helps to support the whole process. The reason I ask is that the community in which I live is very divided, a large group of low-income families, Lots of child and animal abuse, huge problems with younger kids and teens. There's one 10-year-old who is brilliant with horses and on the edge of tipping into a gang lifestyle. He's a good kid with big issues. His mom died last year. His father is uninvolved. I've asked him to come and do play with me once a week, but I'm wondering how much good I can do as a lone voice. All right. So Gabby, thanks for reaching out and obviously sticky situation, but every single one of us as child-centered play therapists fight this battle because there are some parents who are intimately involved and then some who really act like they could care less and everything in between. So when we're thinking about parental involvement, 
Yes, ideally, we know not only from our own experience, but also from evidence in research that when parents are bought in and supportive and involved and invested, we do have more positive outcomes. However, we also know that there are often times when we do not have that, but child-centered play therapy still works. So I think the first thing I want to highlight is the relationship, like I just mentioned with Tammy's email, the relationship is what allows for change. So when you say, I'm wondering how much good I can do as a lone voice, you can be the catalyst for massive change for this boy. Because I, I always think back to Yuri Bronfenbrenner's quote, and I shared this in a parenting podcast episode a while ago, and I'm paraphrasing, I do not have the quote in front of me, but Yuri Bronfenbrenner is quoted in saying something along the lines of, every child needs to have an adult in their life that loves them in a crazy and irrational way. And that's my paraphrase, so please know that's not a direct quote. But when we think about this scenario, mom is dead, dad is not involved, of course he's tipping into gang lifestyle, of course he's looking into all of this other stuff because he needs to feel loved, he needs to feel that he belongs somewhere, he needs to know that someone cares for him. And Gabby, you can be that person because the relationship is what allows for change. So you form that relationship with him, even if it's just one hour once a week. That's what we get in a child-centered playroom, one hour once a week. You pour into him, you provide the be with attitudes, you reflectively respond, you engage in a child-centered way, and that relationship is going to mean everything to him. So I would say you can make a ton of good in that relationship. My second thought is, we can't always, actually we often cannot, it's not can't always, we usually often cannot control other environments, other circumstances. So one of the questions that we're asked often by certain parents is what happens when the environment doesn't change? In other words, dad's house is always going to be chaotic or the school is not going to allow him to have breaks when he gets frustrated, or the soccer coach is not going to tolerate him having a tantrum in the middle of a game. And the question is always, how is child-centered play therapy going to help him or her work through that issue? Because there's going to be no leeway. You're going to give free reign and complete control to the child in the playroom. That's great. But what, how does that translate to other environments? We have no control over other environments. And even when they stay the same, we know that child-centered play therapy allows children to build coping skills and resilience in those static environments. So ideally, would we love to wave our proverbial magic wand and change every environment to be more healthy and happy and positive for our kids? I would assume we would. However, we can't. So we know that the child-centered play therapy process equips kids with the knowledge, the skills, the tools, the coping, the resilience that they need so that when they go into those environments, they handle it differently. They believe in themselves. They trust themselves. They solve their own problems. They don't get as emotionally overwhelmed. It's not as upheaving for them. And they're able to stay more regulated. So Gabby, even when the environment doesn't change, even when he can't have a relationship with his mom and dad, even when there are gang influences around him, he's going to start responding differently. And that's a very powerful thing for us to keep in mind because I think sometimes we feel that our hands are tied and we feel very helpless in situations like this. Gosh, I only have this kid an hour a week. I mean, you know, with all of the stuff going on in this child's life, is this really going to be enough? Well, it's enough for that hour and that relationship is more than enough and everything that the child is able to learn and grow and change in the playroom is going to make huge differences for them no matter where they end up. So Gabby, I hope that that's an answer to your question. I think there are lots of layers to a question like that, but know that the hour that you spend is very, very impactful and meaningful for that little boy. And that's true for all of us. You know, I, I would love to rescue some of my kids from the stuff that they deal with throughout the week. I, I wish I could swoop in and rescue them, but we can't. So we worry about what we do have control over, which is the relationship and what we do when we pour into those kids for the hour each week that we see them. All right, Gabby in South Africa, thank you so much to all my South Africans. I just gave you a shout out a couple 
podcasts ago, and I don't even remember what that phrase was. So sorry, you only got it once. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's move on to Texie. And Texie asked three questions. So I'm going to kind of just tag team this into one. Texie lives in Michigan. Hello to my Michiganders. I say my, but my husband's the Michigander, not me. I'm legit Floridian. But I have a special place in my heart for Michigan. That's where my husband grew up and all of his family still lives there. So hello to my Michiganders. He really gets mad when I shame Michiganians. <laughs> anyway, I digress. Getting back to Texie, Texie reached out and said she has a gazillion questions, but she has narrowed it down to three. So I greatly appreciate that, Texie. Thank you for only sending me three at a time. But here's the first one. In my most recent intakes, I have several children ages 5 to 11 reporting suicidal ideation. How do you manage active or passive suicidal ideation within the context of CCPT? All right. So I, I try really hard and I'm very diligent to provide answers instead of what I would call non-answers. But in this case, I'm going to actually give you a little bit of a non-answer before I try to give you more detail. I would argue, having not been in, in any of these intakes, that these children are not suicidal and they don't have suicidal ideation. I did a podcast episode on this in the parenting, the play therapy parenting podcast episodes about, I forget exactly what it's called, but something along the lines of, you know, what to say when your children say alarming things or I hate my life or something like that. You know, the alarming things that kids say something along those lines. So if you want to go to playtherapyparenting.com, you can search archives and probably locate that by scrolling through the earlier episodes. But I bring that up to say, I've been doing this almost 20 years and it is only in recent years that children have started using phrases that we would categorize as suicidal. And I think that they've been given language that they don't understand. They've heard phrases that they don't understand. And they've been exposed to things that they don't understand. And what I talked about in that podcast episode is that when a child says something like, I just wish I were dead, or I just wish I were never born, or I just want to kill myself... We have to look past the words and we have to look at what the child is trying to communicate because they're not verbal, they're not cognitive, they're not rational. So everything that comes out of their mouth is usually an attempt to explain a feeling. And when you are overwhelmed, when you are miserable, when you have no solutions, when you have no answers, when you don't know why you feel the way you do, when everything seems crazy and confusing, it makes sense for a five, six, eight year old to say, I just wish I wasn't alive. Not because they want to die, but because if they weren't alive, they wouldn't be in the struggle that they find themselves in. And if we get to the root of why they're saying something, it's a totally different reaction than if we focus on the words, which is, I just wish I wasn't alive. Oh my gosh, you're suicidal. So I coached parents through how to respond appropriately to phrases like that. And I think we need to be very intentional about recognizing that a child that does not have abstract reasoning not only does not understand the emotional weight of the things that they're saying, they don't understand that saying, I wish I was never alive or I wish I could die. They don't understand that there's emotional laden content there. They're just saying, this sucks and I don't want to deal with this. That's Brennaism. <laughs> so what we're trying to do there is to recognize their misery, their cry for help, their frustration, their confusion, their misery. And we then take that and we reflect it or we enlarge it. So mm, you've been feeling really bad lately. And or sometimes things are so much to deal with. It would just be easier if you didn't have to deal with that stuff. Okay, so in true CCPT form, we do not, quote, assess for suicidal ideation. And please take that with a grain of salt. I am not saying that we should ethically ignore and not evaluate what's going on, okay? So I'm not saying just ignore it if a child mentions suicide or suicidal ideation. You are ethically bound to be a mandatory reporter and to know how to handle a situation like that. My point of saying that is a child under 13 is much more likely to be saying something that they don't fully understand and they're expressing something very different than what they're actually saying with their words. 
So we have to normalize those kinds of phrases to parents. I've had so many conversations where I say, okay, but you have to understand that's your child's way of saying, I just don't want to have to deal with this. And unfortunately, with social media and YouTube and all of the content that's all over the internet and that's readily known and seen and heard and watched and whatever right now for kids, they're exposed to things that they would have never been exposed to. I don't think I even knew what suicide was until I was a teenager growing up. I mean, maybe I had heard it in passing like once or twice, but I certainly didn't understand the feeling of saying I don't want to live anymore. So we have exposed kids to things that they should never be exposed to at this age. And then we get really concerned and worried when they make reference to the things that they've heard but don't fully understand. And so this has become a very interesting conundrum in which we find ourselves. And therefore, my experience is that when we help parents understand what they're saying is not what they mean... And we're going to help them address the things that are causing them to feel the way they're feeling. And then therefore they will no longer say that. And I can't tell you the number of parents I've had that have told me that their child has said something along these lines, which would be classically categorized as suicidal ideation. And then lo and behold, after they've gone to play therapy for X amount of weeks, they quit saying things like that. So we know that it is their way of expressing how much they're suffering. But in my experience and my opinion, it is not that they do not want to live and they're suicidal. So that's my thought on that, Texie. I hope that's helpful. And I'm happy to hear feedback or other thoughts if y'all want to reach out, Brenna at thekidcouncilor.com. All right, question number two. What do we do with very young kids, three to five, who don't want to stay in the playroom for more than five minutes? When the child leaves to, quote, check on mom, they're not able to successfully transition back into the playroom. They don't seem to care about limits of the session ending if they leave the playroom, but they also always endorse wanting to come back. One additional barrier I'm working around is the group practice expectation that I'm able to bill insurance for the session, meaning it has to be at least 35 minutes. Okay, so I I was going to get into a billing insurance thing, but I'll I'll save that for another day. All right. So let me just answer the question. First of all, three to five-year-old children, that is three is about the youngest. We do see a few two and a half-year-olds, but for the most part, three is going to be the youngest of the sweet spot for child-centered play therapy. So three, four, and five-year-olds are actually very well suited for the child-centered model. So it's not that they're too young. And when you say they don't want to stay in the playroom for more than five minutes because they want to go leave to check on mom, well, that's just a very clear limit setting scenario. So when the child says, I want to go see where mom is, or I want to go check on mom, or I want to go give mom a hug or whatever they say, we very quickly set a limit on the session and the amount of time we have left. So what that would look like is you want to go check on mom, but we still have 45 minutes left of our playtime. You can choose to go out and see her as soon as we're all done. So that is an immediate limit that gets set because the session is for taking place in the playroom. So you mentioned when the child leaves to go check on mom, arguably speaking, the child should not be leaving to go check on mom. So you're going to validate, set the neutral limit, and then let them know that they can choose to go out and check on mom when the session is all done. So then you mentioned they don't seem to care about the limits of the session ending if they leave the playroom. Okay, so that is also not part of the limit that we would set. Because the session takes place regardless of what happens and regardless of behavior. You can't earn it. You can't lose it. So we would never want to say if you choose to leave, you choose to end the session early. Because not only do we give every child the full amount of time for their session, but we also don't use a play session as leverage ever for any reason. You can't earn it. You can't lose it. It just is a a play session because it is a play session. So that would not be part of the limit. You might say... You can choose to go out and check on her at the two minute mark, or you can choose to go out and check on her when our time is up. Which do you choose? But you fall back on the limit that our playtime is for the playroom, or we still have X number of minutes left, or our playtime isn't up yet. So the neutral limit is going to be staying in the playroom, but it's not ever if you choose to leave, you choose to end the session early. And then that will naturally address the, it has to be at least 35 minutes. So I hope that that is helpful in that scenario. Just as a related aside, we never force a child into a playroom. We never insist that they go back. 
it is the child's choice to come back with us. But once they are in the play session, the entire 50 minute play session is for taking place in the playroom. And so that becomes a natural expectation. So the child chooses to come back, but then the limit is that the child does not leave the playroom unless it's to use the restroom. And if the child is having a difficult time coming back, we remind them of the limit. We reflect their feelings. We provide choices. We invite them to head back periodically while they have not yet chosen to go back. We can wonder if they're ready. I'll often say, I wonder if you're ready to go back to the playroom now. But again, we're going to let them choose to come back. Once they're back there, the rest of the session takes place in the playroom. All right. And then question number three, I'm interested in understanding the impact of CCPT on children with exposure to substances in utero. Anecdotally, have you experienced CCPT having a positive impact on this population? All right. So I have worked with several children. When I say several, I would probably say four or five and granted, in almost 20 years, my N is quite small, but I do want you to know, not only you, Texie, but all of you, I have in fact worked with enough children that have been exposed to substances in utero. Several will act were actually born addicted, and they were placed for adoption, they were placed into foster care, et cetera, et cetera. So I have worked with several, and in every scenario, absolute on purpose, CCPT has been extremely effective for those children. And specifically, I would say that we noticed that their regulation increased leaps and bounds. They were much more aware of others. They developed an emotional vocabulary and they developed coping skills. And some of those are universal outcomes, but I thought back over the children with whom I've worked that specifically had been exposed to substances in utero, and I thought through what were the biggest changes or the most noteworthy observations that I remembered, and those were the four things that came to my mind across those children. And I would actually say that children who have been exposed to substances in utero are often similar to children, for example, that have born with congenital issues and or learning disabilities and or potentially autism spectrum disorder, disorders, the, the whole gamut of them, because they come in with a little bit additional challenges. So it's not only the psychological and the mental, but then there are usually physical and chemical and neurobiological things going on. So it kind of adds an additional layer to our work. But I personally have found that it's very effective. I've not read studies specifically. I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm just saying I've not read any studies personally on that specific population. But I have found it successful with the small group of children with whom I've worked in the course of my career. So Texi from Michigan, thank you so much for the email. I appreciate all of your questions. And then finally, Stephanie from Massachusetts, all of my Massachusetts people, Y'all are wicked cool. I don't have the accent to back it up, but, you know, trying to make you feel loved. All right. So Stephanie says, I'd like to know your thoughts. Gosh, this is like I could talk about this one all day, but I'll spare your time. So I would like to know your thoughts on ADHD as a diagnosis for children and its treatment. Many times I'm conflicted with an ADHD diagnosis since the child's behaviors seem somewhat normal to being a child. For example, difficulty sitting still all day. And understandable, given their story and environment, for example, trauma, stress, distractions, inconsistency, lack of structure at home, etc. Amen. I would like to know your clinical opinion as to the validity of the diagnosis, <clears throat> your thoughts on medicating children diagnosed with ADHD, and your experience treating children who come to therapy because of their dysregulation attributed to ADHD. I'm concerned that diagnosing children with ADHD and putting them on medication has become the norm. Yes, it has. And I would love to know how you see this trend. Okay. Oh, and then she says, you accompany me through all my chores and getting ready in the morning. So thank you for helping, uh, having me help you do chores and getting ready. All right, Steph. So gosh, where do I begin? I think I have probably said this more than I've said anything else in the course of my entire almost two decades of career. ADHD is completely overdiagnosed and completely overmedicated. So I think I've probably said that, my gosh, thousands of times. I, I've lost count. 
probably the most consistent phrase that I've said. Why? Because it is the most consistent diagnosis that parents bring up. They're concerned about, they already have been given a diagnosis, they're considering the diagnosis, they've been told their child needs to be on medication, they've been told they need to have an evaluation for it, the pediatrician has suggested that it's probably the cause of all issues, blah, blah, blah. So I feel like that comes up the most often and therefore my response is all the time that it is over-diagnosed and over-medicated. So that's where I start. I 100% agree with you. It has become the norm. And unfortunately, and look, I, I am not an anti-pediatrician kind of girl, okay? But I shouldn't say but, that negates everything that I said. I'm not an anti-pediatrician kind of girl. I do see a difference in the way that we approach children, however. And what I mean by that is, a pediatrician typically sees a child one time a year for a well checkup, annual wellness checkup. And mom sits down, dad sits down, caregiver sits down and says, yeah, so gosh, I mean, my kid just bounces off the wall all the time. And I mean, he just does not listen. And the teachers have even said that he seems really distractible. And I mean, it's just, it's like gotten a little bit crazy. And I just don't know if it's normal or whatever. Oh, he probably has ADHD here. And then there starts the process. Diagnosis which I consider, I, in my opinion only, I consider it to be flippant. You have not even spent any time with this child in the last year. You're going on a report from a parent. And not to say that those issues are not relevant or significant, but it does not necessarily mean that that is a pervasive problem. And it does not mean the child actually meets diagnostic criteria. So I think sometimes the diagnosis is made flippantly. And then they immediately go toward medication because medical model is diagnose and treat with medicine. We look at it as let's address the emotional, the social, the academic, the mental, the relational, all of it. And let's holistically see what's going on with the child. And then we can reevaluate. That's what I say to parents all the time. Okay, so you've suggested ADHD, you've been you know, influence that it might be ADHD. The child has already been diagnosed with ADHD. Sometimes the child is already on medication for ADHD. Okay. So let's not mess with that right now. Let's start child-centered play therapy and let's get a decent way into the process. And then we will reevaluate. And what I always say is I've only ever had one family in almost 20 years still pursue an ADHD diagnosis and ADHD medication after completing an entire round of treatment with me and child center play therapy. And that's true. One family in almost 20 years. When I say almost 20 years, next year is my 20th year. So in 19 years, I've had one family after an entire course of child center play therapy still struggle enough, still have enough issues, still feel that it's warranted to say, okay, let's have an official evaluation and see if diagnostic criteria is met. So with those kinds of numbers, and I don't know how many children with whom I've worked that ADHD has been in the conversation, but I'm going to take a guess that it has to be in the thousands. So we have that number of kids with an ADHD consideration at least, and one family at the end of it all saying, I still think this is warranted. So in my mind, the way my data-driven brain works is this isn't coincidental, which leads me to the second part of your question. I'm conflicted with the diagnosis because the, the behaviors seem somewhat normal to be a, being a child and understandable given their story and environment. That's what I say ad nauseum to every parent. We have to recognize that the diagnostic criteria for ADHD are associated with dozens of other things. You can have a highly, a highly anxious child that presents ADHD. You can have a highly aggressive child that presents as ADHD. You can have a child with no coping and no regulation skills present as ADHD. So there's so much carryover. There's so much overlap. And you can look at diagnostic criteria and say, check that box, check that box, check that box. But can we say that it is truly chemical in nature? Not without evaluating all of the other parts of what's going on with the child. 
So Steph, you specifically mentioned trauma, high stress, distractions, inconsistency, lack of structure. Would all of those things contribute to diagnostic criteria being met for ADHD, but it not having a chemical root? 100%. So we cannot look at behavior in isolation and not understand that there are so many factors involved. So the final piece of it, your experience treating children who come to therapy because of their dysregulation and my thoughts on medicating children. Since you've asked for my thoughts, I will be very blunt and frank. ADHD medication is an absolute waste. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of money. The dose is never right. The frequency of the dose is never right. The brand is never right. The titration is never right. Do we do half a pill in the morning and half a pill at night? Do we do only in the morning? Do we do only at night? Do we do morning and night? Do we use this brand? Do we do five milligrams? Do we do 10 milligrams? Should we take them off of it on the weekends? Should we keep them on it during the school year only and not have them on it in the summer? Holy Moses. I mean, it's insanity. Then we haven't even talked about the side effects. We haven't even talked about the long-term ramifications of a child being on that kind of medication. We haven't talked about the fact that it often changes their personalities. We also haven't talked about the fact that it takes time to build up in a child's system. So parents are typically looking for a quick fix. They're looking for, quote, immediate regulation with the issues. Well, the issue with that is you have to let it build up. You have to let it adjust. You have to see what's going on. You have to see how the child responds to it. That's typically a two to three month process. So we're already three months in before we even, quote, know if it's working. 98 out of 100 times, it's not. So then it's like, well, let's try this dose. Let's try this change. Let's dose it in the morning instead. Let's only give it during the week. Oh, my gosh. It's years and years and years of playing around with the psychopharmacological element of this. Say that four times fast. That's a big word. (laughs) And then you have a child that's been strung along through this process, side effects and all, for two, three years. And then that's typically when parents go, I don't even really know if it's helping. I don't even really know if it's really working that much. I mean, maybe I feel like sometimes it does, but then other times I feel like we could take it off and it wouldn't even matter. Oh my gosh. If we don't see evidence that something is effective immediately, then we, we shouldn't be playing around with it. So you asked for my thoughts, Stephanie, and I'm just being very blunt. I think it is an absolute waste. And I think it's doing a disservice to our kids, quite honestly. So I always advocate to avoid medication. If a child is already on medication, then obviously we leave them on it when we start play therapy because we don't want them to take the child off the meds and start therapy because then causality gets confounded. So we don't want to change two things at once. So then I typically recommend them staying on medication, doing play therapy, and then considering removing the medication once therapy is further into the process and things are a little bit more stable for the child. But I, I, I have nothing good to say about medication. Now, let me give a disclaimer because I know that words matter and I know that interpretation matters as well. I try to make sure that I consider all perspectives and how my words can be interpreted. So this is one of my disclaimers to address that. Are there certain children who absolutely chemically need medication for hyperactivity and distractibility? Yes. I am not anti-ADHD meds on principle. I'm anti-ADHD meds for kids that don't need it. And 99% of children on ADHD meds don't need it because it is not a chemically rooted issue. It is not a neurobiological issue. It's environmental, it's emotional, it's psychological, it's mental, it's academic, it's something. But it is not a chemical issue, therefore it does not need to be addressed chemically. Do you get where I'm going with this? So I am not fundamentally opposed to medication for children who actually need it. The issue is that most of the kids that are taking these meds do not need it. They also don't need the diagnosis either. And then finally, to answer your final question, what is my experience treating kids who come to therapy because of their dysregulation? My experience is all of their symptoms disappear. 
because it was never an ADHD issue in the first place. So their dysregulation improves, their impulsivity improves, their distractibility improves, their chaotic, frantic behavior improves. They are able to sit and focus. They're calmer. They're more centered. They're more stable. Why? Because those are the outcomes of child-centered play therapy. And it addressed all of the things that were going on with the child, not just looking at letters after the child's name and saying, okay, it's ADHD, so we have to medicate. So Stephanie, thank you so much for the question. I hope that that fires you all up. I, I know I get a little <laughs> pushy, maybe. I don't know what the word is. Impassioned. That's a better word. I, I know that I get on soapboxes and I kind of rant sometimes, but I, I was just talking about this on my coaching calls this last week, actually on Monday as well. It is our job to advocate on behalf of our kids. And I'm not doing my job it actually makes me mad. This is why I get so fired up, y'all. It makes me angry what we are doing to kids right now. And I could give you a laundry list of all the ways that I feel like we are doing such a disservice to kids right now, starting with screens, starting with devices. Oh my gosh, I, I, I could go off. But we do not, we don't do kids justice with the things that we do, the, th the, the way that we handle things what's going on, what parents know and don't know, and what pedi pediatricians know and don't know, and what teachers know and don't know. It, no one is really, truly, except child-centered play therapists maybe, no one is really, truly meeting kids where they are and understanding what's going on with them. So when we advocate on behalf of kids, we don't let crap like this happen. We have hard conversations. We sit down with parents and pediatricians and whatever stakeholders are in the child's life. And we say, I, I really need you to hear this. And this may not be what you want to hear, but it's what you need to hear. And here are my thoughts on this. And here's my opinion on this. And here's my experience with this. And I want to educate you a little bit. And I'm not going to try to sway your opinion, but I want you to be informed so that you can make the best decision. And here's what I know, and here's what I think, and here's my professional opinion, and here's why I don't think this is the best course of action. Parents trust us because we're professionals. Parents trust us because we understand kids. Therefore, the responsibility lies on us to say, get your kids off these stupid meds, and no, he doesn't need an ADHD diagnosis, and here's why. These are the conversations that we are forced to have, and honestly, we should be proud to have them. Because if not us who, and if not now when, is someone going to advocate on behalf of those kids? It's our job. So I think we should boldly do it. And I think we should be impassioned about it. And maybe we should be a little pushy, to use my earlier word. I think that it requires that of us. You know what? This is a calling, y'all. I mean, as... As a Christian, as a believer, I believe it's God's calling on my life. You may feel that it's a calling of a different kind, but... The, the point is, we have a calling to do this work. We have been called to help children. It fulfills us. It excites us. It drives us. But that means all of the things that come with working with kids. And one of the major things is advocacy. We have to speak up for kids that can't speak up for themselves. And so this is one of those topics that I feel like we have to be bold enough to tell people our experience and what we think. So Stephanie, I really appreciate the email. Thanks for writing in from Massachusetts, all my New Englanders. Oh my gosh, I just did a presentation for New England APT, maybe a month or so ago. And I was so excited to be with all of you New Englanders. That, that was a fun presentation. So, all right, y'all, you know how much I love you. I hope you have a lovely week. If you want to reach out to me again, Brenna at the kidcounselor.com, I'd love to hear from you. I haven't mentioned it in a while. So if you need some CEUs, please go to childcenteredtraining.com. And I've partnered with Corewell to give you CEUs for your licensure renewal and for your RPT. So there's quite a few courses up there that are on demand. And then we're working on some new live courses for the end of the summer and for the fall. So childcenteredtraining.com is where you'll get that. And... Hopefully we can continue to put out some CEU content so that you all can get CCPT CEUs instead of whatever other theoretical orientations are out there. <laughs> all right. Love y'all. We'll talk again soon. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Play Therapy Podcast with Dr. Brenna Hicks. For more episodes and resources, please go to www.playtherapypodcast.com.